Once again, I would like to personally apologize for the sound of bass dropping and the shower going off right around the corner here. That's because we are surrounded by people who think they are black, even though they are as white as white can be. Hello YouTube, this is Adam Noyce of AN Productions, and joining me is my good friend, Mark Allen Shoppy Jr. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. You did. Okay. So, judging by the title of this review, you kind of know what this review is. It is a review of Snapple Apple. Mark, what is the movie we are taking a look at today? I believe it's called Quidan. Yes, it's called Quidan. Directed by legendary director, Nozaki Kobayashi. Now, you've never heard of Nozaki Kobayashi before. Only by name, I believe. Alright, so you haven't seen, like, any of his films. This is your first experience with him. Yes. It was, ironically, my first experience with him, too. I didn't plan that out. I actually did. I just said, Mark, you have to watch this movie. Yeah. But, so, so you have no nostalgia for Well, sort of. Saw it three days ago. Right. This was around the time period where I started getting into the idea of watching a film subtitled. Yeah. Um, this, this was... <laughs> okay. I have a lot of nostalgia for this movie. I first saw this movie when I was in seventh grade. And it was on a double bill with Seven Samurai and then this film. I remember it distinctly because I was grounded. I did something really, 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 really bad and I deserved being grounded. Okay, I'll tell you that. But I did something really, really, really bad and I had lost use of all electronics for two weeks. I had planned ahead of time, because we had DVR, to record Seven Samurai and Quiet Anne mm -hmm. and that they were still being recorded. So after bitching, not merely bitching, but begging my mother, because my father was out of town, because if my father was home, this would not have happened. But I begged my mother, can you at least let me watch Quiet Ann? And she was like, okay. So this was the only thing I could watch, was Quiet Ann. Any other time, I had to go in my room, and my TV was gone, everything was gone. All electronics were gone. The only thing that I watched was Quiet Ann during that two-week time period. Okay. So it kind of stuck out in my head, you know what I'm saying? It's like, oh my god, this is the only form of entertainment that I really have other than reading a book. But I haven't watched this film in four years. For, like, from this moment on, like, by, back four years, for four years, I haven't watched it for many, many, many years. And so I finally bought it on Blu-ray. My parents, ironically, my parents gave it to me for Christmas. And I adore this film and I was finally able to sit down and watch it and what was interesting was actually let me grab the disc recently Criterion Collection released the original cut of the film this is the original director's cut of the film quite then on this beautiful blu-ray here and beautifully restored and everything like that to its original running time length of three hours and three minutes that's pretty damn long however the cut that I grew up with is the copy that Mark is holding up which was their original release. That was the 161 minute Cannes cut. It was originally released in, uh, Cannes, in the Cannes Film Festival back in 1964 when the film was released. And they said it had to be cut, so Masaki Kobayashi cut out about 20 minutes worth of footage. But that was the cut that I grew up on. Being able to sit down and watch those 20 minutes of footage added back in to the, to, to, to the Criterion Collection version was just utterly astonishing. And the reason why this was only released recently was because they found it in a warehouse. They found the original uncut version of Quiet Man in a warehouse in Japan. And so they said, oh my god, we got to restore it. Before that, all we had was this 161 minute cut, the Cannes Film Festival cut. And so they restored it, and they restored it with the technology that they had at the time. This is quite an old disc. Yeah. Um, they, they restored it very, very well. And so... Unfortunately, Mizaki Kobayashi, the actual director of this movie, never got to see his cut of the movie ever really released. Yeah, that kind of, he, that kind of sucks. That sucks. Um, he never got to see his original cut of the film. However, um, they did actually, because what happened was he was dying. And so the, the, the uh, co-director of the film and the producer said, we have to find this original cut and release it and restore it. And so they've managed to only find the cans cut, and they restored it, and they showed it to Masaki Kobayashi. Apparently he cried, because this was the film that he wanted to release more than any of his other films. And he's right. made a lot of films. And he said, 
this is probably the closest I'll ever get to having my film released. Thank you so much for doing what you have. And unfortunately, he passed away before they were able to release this, uh, before Criterion was able to update their disc and release the original unedited version. So that's kind of sad, kind of sad. Mizaka Kobayashi is my favorite Japanese film director of all time. I mean, The Human Condition, Samurai Rebellion, all movies in which you need to watch. And what were what were your overall thoughts of the movie? Um, from like the beginning, I like from like the very start of the movie, I knew like I was going to enjoy it. I mean, I felt like I was going to enjoy it anyway, knowing that it was a uh, it's a Japanese film, so I was obviously going to enjoy it in some way. But um, I by the end of it, I really uh, I thoroughly enjoyed everything about it. I certainly think it's a masterpiece beyond comprehension. Like, this, mm -hmm. this, I was talking about I don't think could possibly do this film justice. You have to go out and watch this movie. It is just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, and this was a dramatic change of pace for Mizaki Kobayashi. Mizaki Kobayashi was mainly known for directing social dramas. Right. that commented on Japanese society during a time period or something. And he usually was able to do that using period pieces, you know, and having a conversation about, you know, single parenthood or something like that set in feudal Japan. He could get away with it because mm -hmm. of that. Um, and that's what he usually did, Samurai Rebellion, for example. His two biggest examples, Samurai Rebellion and Harakiri, are nothing but a middle finger to the Bushido Code. Right. And just tears apart the whole samurai tradition and everything like that. Four films were just released by Criterion through the Eclipse series. I don't know if you're aware of Oh, that. yeah, yeah. Um, and it was actually called Challenging the Status Quo. And Masaki Kobayashi prided himself on challenging every sort of social state that Japan was in. Uh, he was never, quite frankly, he was a little bit of a rabble-rouser. And, and okay. Though if you spoke to him, he was, he was like the most humble guy ever. You know, mm -hmm. it's like he wouldn't do anything like that, but his films really brought out his kind of leftist kind of philosophy. Um, and that's because a lot of times, he had a lot of experience during World War II. And he barely escaped having to fight in the Battle of Okinawa, which was the bloodiest battle in the Pacific Theater. Mm -hmm. uh, like almost 300,000 civilians alone were killed during that battle. He barely escaped that, but he was he was uh, stationed over in Manchuria, near one of the places where the Japanese would experiment on Chinese people to see what viruses would do to them. Oh, okay. Uh, he was stationed near there, and basically, that's more of a story for if I ever talk about the human condition, because basically the human condition, which is that nine-hour epic that yeah. I was telling you about, mm -hmm. is basically Masaki Kobayashi's story. Uh, that's basically his story. Uh, but what happened here, was that Har he, the previous film that he made before this was Harakiri. And Harakiri is a masterpiece of its own, but he started experimenting with style and lights and everything like that in that film. He wanted to take that a step further. Uh, he wanted to do something new. He was kind of bored doing his traditional stuff. And so what, what he did was he loved old time art. He loved like the original, like the, the, the kind of scrolls. Yeah, the scroll art. Right. Um, he loved those. And he based all of his sets and everything like that off of those kind of scrolls, off of those kind of pictorial styles. And that's why a lot of these sets, despite them being vast and huge, and we'll get to them later, are very two-dimensional. If, if you look at them, he shoots them in a very two-dimensional panel. One of the examples I have of that is when, um, during The Woman of the Snow, you have the setting sun, and then you have the woman here and, and uh, the man here, right? Yeah. And that's when they first meet for the first time. And it's very, it's a big set, but it looks two-dimensional. Right, yeah. Um, and the other thing, too, is that he never used, you know, like the three-point perspective or one-point perspective. Like, you know, Kubrick, like, prided himself of using the one-point perspective and using a lot of depth of field. These films have a lot of... Um, Kobayashi's film here has a lot of horizontal lines. And instead of something going off into the distance, it'll go off this way, in this direction, at some kind of an angle. 
Uh, I don't know if you noticed that. That's that's what he did, and he based them off of the scrolls. And this is also, I can't believe this. I cannot believe this. This was his first film in color. This was his first color film. Really? Yeah. I, I wouldn't imagine. I mean, like, the way the color is used in this film is just flat out gorgeous. Yeah. Which which one do you think had the best kind of like color schemes, or what's what's one that like really stood out to you, where you just remember the colors? I would have to say, um, Woman of the Snow. What was which part? Um. I mean, the first thing I noticed was the the backdrop used with the the things that look like the eyes. Oh God! Yeah. I, I found yeah. that I found that very odd, but also very interesting. Yeah, it was definitely a very interesting aesthetic choice. Like they were always being watched. Yeah. And, and then, like the scenes when it was like around sunset, like as soon as that scene started I'm, I was there like going oh my, like, oh my god this is so beautiful like, <laughs> yeah. like repeatedly yeah. like oh this is, oh god um, because it's just like a sea of like orange and reds and yellows yeah and it's fucking gorgeous oh yeah um, the one that I think of is from Hoichi the Earless when, when they bring him to, to play the Bawa the ba Bawa Bawa Biwa Biwa okay the Biwa when he plays the Biwa in front of the ghosts yeah. And he's on, like, that podium or, like, that little stand and there's water all around him. Oh, yeah. There's all this mist that comes in, and it's nothing but, like, mixtures of blues and reds. And it's so gorgeous just looking at this set. And it's no surprise to me that Kobayashi spent hours upon hours and even took a, a class at a university on the study of the color, co color panels just so he made sure that, you know, the color... The, the colors of the film were right and that they mm. fit together better and they didn't clash or that they clashed in a good way and if somebody told me like right off the bat like, if I didn't know this previous that this was his first color film I, I'd be shocked because this, this man knew how to use color apparently he didn't like color because he rarely went with color after this in his career he rarely did color ever again like, Even, did, they, did he do other... Yeah, he did a couple of them. I haven't seen any of them, but he made like he made mostly black and white films from this point on, and then beforehand he never made any. But another thing too uh, is that this film was the most expensive Japanese film ever made until a movie called Virus, made in 1980, which I've also seen, and that movie's kind of bad. It kind of surprised me the first time I heard it that this is like the most expensive Japanese movie I've ever made. I was like, really? you think it would have been some grand epic of some kind, or, you know, mm. something like that. Uh, something made by um, Hiroshi Nagaki. I don't know if you know who he is. But he made a lot of... He was basically like the Japanese David Lean. Oh, okay. Uh, he made a lot of big, epic movies. What happened was that Kobayashi and his crew got... He worked for Shochiku, uh, mm. which was another Japanese film studio. Yeah. And the money... He hadn't shot a foot of film. And the film was already costing a shit ton of money because he was built, they were getting ready to build all these sets and doing so much pre-production. Shochiku fired him. He had, he had worked with Shochiku his entire career. And so right here, all of a sudden, Shochiku fired him. And the entire crew, I believe it was called Ninjin Club. They had a little credit at the beginning of the film. But they, they were the kind of group that was working with him, with Kobayashi on the making of this film. And they were fired. And so Toho wound up buying them was like, okay, we'll, we'll, make you, we'll let you complete the film, but this is your budget. No more going over. You're already the most expensive movie ever made. So basically they gave Toho, or Toho gave them the footage, the actors, and everything along those lines. But the problem was, was that this film was so large in terms of how many sets this film was going to be used, because Kobayashi rarely went on location with this film. In fact, there's only like a handful of scenes throughout this entire th the entire thing that are actually shot outdoors really like yeah i couldn't really tell because well i mean you just kept telling me that like you know most of it was on set so i wasn't yeah you know, thinking like okay that might have been like out of like not there is only yeah there's only a handful of scenes in throughout this entire movie in which were actually shot outdoors and on location the rest of it was done on the sets and these sets were massive mark yeah huge I, they built these things full scale and every single set of Toho was being used at one point. 
every single set, every single back lot was being used for this movie. I, I can only imagine. And so Kobayashi was like bouncing back and forth between each freaking set, going like, let's do this, let's do this, all right, now we're gonna, all right, no, you're gonna do this, all right, while you were on the camera, I'm gonna run over to this set, I'm gonna direct this actor, and that's what was going on. It's so much footage was being used on this film. But the, the set for Hiro, uh, Hirochi the Earless was so big, they couldn't film it on at Toho or any studio. So they actually bought an abandoned military hangar that was used when the during the American occupation, and oh, they really? okay. yeah they they built it back up and they built that entire hangar and made it into the set. It was either the temple for Hoichi the Earless or it was the temple for the spirits in Hoichi the Earless, but it was fucking huge, and they built it to scale, um, and so that's where the money for this movie went. Just, I couldn't even imagine the amount of lights it must have taken to light this goddamn set. It's huge. <laughs> There's all, I've also noticed a couple, a couple of um, lighting cues as well. Theatrical, like, 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 theatrical like, lighting cues. Yeah. yeah. Specifically, the one that stands out to me is the last shot of the movie. Um, the, the very last shot of the movie is the one of like the tipped over teacup. Oh yes, yes. And it, all the lights just slowly like dim, and then there's just like a spotlight on it. Um, Kobe, that's a Kobayashi trait actually. Kobayashi does that throughout all of his movies. It started with the Human Condition. Um. But yeah, very theatrical. This movie's very, very theatrical. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't like he wanted you not to know that this was filmed on a set, either. He wanted you to know that this was filmed on a set. It kind of reminded me of Kabuki, almost. Uh, yeah. Just kind of like the style of the sets. Um, because there's no hiding a set from outdoors. And it's like he wanted you to know, especially on... The one that stuck out to me the most was Woman of the Snow. The Woman of the Snow, the beginning, where they were actually walking through the snowstorm, mm -hmm. was like he wanted you to know that this was an abnormal set. Right. Uh, but I think I remember like reading about it that it didn't do well. No, <laughs> it didn't. Uh, this movie was panned when it was released in Japan. Panned. Uh, that's because I, I don't believe... Uh, it was Japan. It was Japan. I was, I was afraid you were going to say that. Uh, it was panned mainly because audiences thought it was too old-fashioned. They thought it was, they thought it, it was too reminiscent of like older older cinemas pre World War II and everything like that. Audiences mm -hmm. didn't think it was too fast enough or too modernized enough. And I could see why. I, I can genuinely see why. Just to help the simplicity of the soundtrack. Um, and the, the whole thing of it being consciously filmed on a set. I think another thing could be is that, you know, since these are all, since all four of the stories are based off on, like, you know, folk tales, very, yeah. s very, like, yeah. simple stories and not, like, these mostly, like, original ideas of, like, yeah, other films. Yeah, these were all based off of stories by, uh, I forget his first name, but his last name is Hearn. And he wasn't even Japanese. He yeah. was, he was, an, I think he was Irish, and he came over to Japan, and he just got swept up in the American, in the, uh, in the Japanese culture, and just became a Japanese citizen, and he wrote all these stories. Yeah. And these are four of his stories that these are, that these films are based on, or that these stories are based on. However, though it was panned, it was Japan. Though it was Japan, um, the, the film was hailed overseas. In, that, that's in, like, in Europe, in Japan, in, uh, in America, that, in That's Britain. usually how it works. If it's not good in one country, it's good in every other country. Yeah. I've noticed that Heaven's Gates was hailed in Europe, but panned horribly in the United States. Um, but yeah, this movie, this movie was received very well. However, though it was received well, it was, they were all not the original cuts of the movies. They were all heavily cut versions of the films. Yeah. The most extreme cut of this was the one that was released in the United States for a brief period of time in a few film festivals, was they completely cut out The Woman of the Snow. Like, entirely? The, the, entire, the entire section was cut out, deleted. Uh, which, actually, Woman of the Snow is my favorite. I think, overall, it's my favorite story in the whole thing. Speaking of that, which one's yours? I mean, I probably would say Woman of the Snow. Mm -hmm. It's not the most known story in this, but by far the most known story that's remembered from this film is Hoichi the Earless. Uh, that one has been remembered by so much, but uh, 
No, I, I think for me it's because Woman in the Snow is a very, um, well, not, not just like in this film, but like the story itself is a pretty uh, iconic story. Like it in, is. In Japan. It is, yeah. Or variations of it, definitely. Are. Yeah. The whole, the whole woman, the woman was, we'll get to that when we actually talk about right. the story. But Mark, could you basically give a brief kind of outline of the first story, which was called The Black Hair? Uh, let's see. It's basically about a was it a, was it a samurai? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He decides to divorce his wife, who they've been living in a very like you know rickety uh, old place. Yeah. Like they were living in poverty, and he decided to leave her to marry somebody else. And during the time that he's married to the second woman, he keeps remembering about his first wife to the point where he just regrets ever leaving her. So he decides to go back. And while it seems that, you know, she's still there and she's, you know, happy to see him and they kind of get it on. Yeah. When, yeah. he, when you know he wakes when he wakes up in the morning he finds out that it was all an illusion and that he basically slept with a corpse of his first wife yeah it's a really creepy scene too when when yeah. he finds out that she's dead I wasn't sure if they were gonna show anything or not because like they, they do the thing the thing is when I was watching this I kind of remember seeing something seen like a story like this before probably like, i don't yeah. i don't know where this, this has been this movie has been remade a few times in japan this movie the movie itself has been remade a few times in japan but i wasn't sure like like what are they gonna do with like with the wife's body i thought it was gonna be like a very like cheesy skeleton with like no, the, the yeah. hair or anything but they decided to do like a sh shriveled up corpse. Yeah, a very like, decomposed like, corpse. Like, it's very disgusting. Yeah. And, well, that's Kobayashi. Kobayashi would do stuff like that. That's one thing that I also want to say about this this film. It's not scary. You know, I know I'm listing this under a horror movie kind of thing, well, yeah, but well, it's, yeah. not, it's not really a horror movie at all. Though, it's like, not these, scary. all these stories, they're, they're considered ghost stories. Yeah. But they're not, like, it's not like, you know, you know, scared the crap out of you go story no they're very atmospheric in fact yeah. that's what this movie prides itself on is mm -hmm. how atmospheric it can be and to me that's all that works better it's not scary but it's it can be creepy yeah and that scene where he finds the corpse and he starts decomposing himself yeah is very creepy actually i gotta say this that episode the black hair has almost no audio in it at all yeah, that was one thing I found really odd about parts of this movie, because there are times when, because a lot of this movie, there's, like, absolutely no soundtrack. It's silent. It's very, very quiet. Yeah. To the point where it's not, like, the only sounds that you hear are, like, very important sounds. Like, at times, if someone's just, like, walking, yeah. you don't really hear anything. Especially with that one. Yeah. Because when... He, uh, when the samurai comes back and the house is like in worse condition than before, you hear him walking around, even like opening doors. But you, at times you don't even hear the you doors. You don't. You don't hear his footsteps. The only time when you actually hear something is when like his when his foot like you know goes through the floor. You hear yeah. that. Yeah, and and a lot of that was done on purpose. Um, it, that's because this film didn't really have like a sound mixing crew. And this film, one was shot silent because there's so many fans and so many lights and so many generators going off, making all the lights and make it almost impossible to do any. Yeah, yeah. It makes but anyway, sense. what they did was um, Mazaki Kobayashi worked very close with the composer of this movie, Toru Tokamitsu, who he worked on a lot of samurai films and stuff like that. And he's actually known mainly for working with Kobayashi, and he actually was the sound mixer for the film. He he said, "I want the soundtrack and the." the actual sound track of the movie to be the same thing. And and so Toru Tokimitsu 
went into it. And there's some sections where even when, like, the wood breaks or something like that in the sequence where he's going into the house where it's off. Yeah. The sounds are off. They always sound so out of place. And that's not a bad thing. To right. me, it made it more creepy and atmospheric. It's like yeah. everything is not right here, and especially in the black hair. He nailed it in the black hair because, yeah. like, nine, there's almost like there's hardly any dialogue throughout this entire episode. A lot of it is done by the narrator, mm -hmm. um, and it's also done with sound effects. One of the other ones too that kind of struck me is when the horse is running. The yeah, like it didn't quite sync up right. And all of a sudden, all you hear is like the dong, dong. You'd hear like you'd hear like the, the it was actually an untuned piano and the cowbell <laughs> that he'd hit, and then all of a sudden he'd shoot the arrow, and it, you'd hear Psh! and he and it would break the the target. But that was just another one. But um, man, I I think the soundtrack for this movie is just fucking gorgeous in general. But what what did you think of the main character of this, the the, the samurai? Did you think he was sad, or did you think he kind of deserved it? Because I've 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 had two, I've read two different opinions on this on the samurai. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of like a mixture of both. Because at times you're like, why why the hell did you, well, why the hell did you leave this woman in the first place? When she loved him, yeah, very, like, very like very you much. two seemed very happy together, and then you just like just up and leave her. He was young. And it was like he, he was too ambitious. Yeah. And he wanted something better for himself, leaving her behind. That's what he was trying. That's what was happening with the story. Right. And I personally think he's a very sad character. Because um, there's, there's a couple things. As we said, he abandons his real wife. But what I noticed is that um, his first wife, who's I think actually genuinely a nice person, almost yeah. too nice mm -hmm. for, for him, when he pushes her away, you know, he has like that thing and he pushes her off of him. Yeah. Which is a very tough thing to watch. He never looks down at her. She's always looking up at him, tears drooling down her face, saying, Oh my God, take me with you. Oh my God, please stay. And it, it cuts to this really low angle of him just looking like he's fighting back the urge to stay. And he never looks at her when he pushes her away. Yeah. I like that. That's a little touch. That's that's Kobayashi. Kobayashi's very good at capturing intense moments like that. Instead, what he gets is this fucking miserable bitch. That woman that yeah. he, she's all did you notice the black teeth? That that's actually a thing. That is. That that's a okay. thing that like all right. like the royalty does. Like along what? with the, along with that they have like what? they shave it's like they shave the eyebrows and like paint them back on or something like that. Yeah, I knew that. I knew that, but why I, I, you I don't paint your teeth black. That's one thing I don't understand about that. You no, know, there was also I, I, did, I didn't do any research on that. There's also a tradition where it's like, um, apparently, if you're if you reach the age of seventy, if you're a woman, you have to break all your teeth. All right. If you're in royalty, yeah, yeah. I Japanese don't. are fucked up. But anyway, she this this his second wife was just a miserable, selfish bitch. And the scene that really brought that out was the sequence where she's playing like the game and she yawns. <laughs> I'm bored of this. Right. I, right. And I'm like, oh, God damn it. And he calls her an ungrateful. And in a way, he is ungrateful because without her, he won't have any of the money that he has. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's miserable. So what he does is he leaves her and he goes to try to find his other wife. I have a certain interpretation of that ending. And this is actually me kind of based on the audio commentary. The audio commentary isn't that good. <laughs> I'm actually going to say that. The audio commentary for this movie is not anything special. It's actually quite boring. But there are some good moments in it. Um, and how I interpreted this was that, you know, how, you notice how the guy, as soon as he discovers that his wife has been dead, she probably killed herself. Um, his wife has been dead. I actually think that he was already that old. And, like, he's been trapped in this kind of void where it just, like, keeps circling back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, over and over and over again. Because the man starts aging as soon as he finds out that the first wife is dead. Yeah. I really like the... 
how it changed. It changes. The makeup, they keep, they keep adding on more and more makeup as it, as it goes along. Um, the actual, the, the cut of the 161 minute cut ends when he looks into the well for the first time and then it cuts to a freeze frame and then it fades out to black. That's where it ends. On the extended cut, there's a scene where it's like the hair strangles him and that's the end. Yeah, the, 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 the hair on a wire. The, the, yeah. the, 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 <laughs> the wig attacking kind of threw me off guard. Isn't it weird? I, I wish I was they like, didn't do it. I was yeah. like, oh, okay. That was quite odd um, <laughs> that was quite odd um, and I did laugh it was kind of funny just seeing this hair I could see why they cut it out in the in the in the Ken's cut because it looks silly <laughs> it's it's really silly yeah. um, but anyways what you I thought this was a pretty good way to start this movie it really yeah. set up the theme because mm -hmm. it's very the theme of this movie is just regular people ex not knowing that they're experiencing the paranormal until it's too late. That's the overarching kind of theme of each story. Yeah. Uh, the woman in the snow, big example. Hoichi the earless, he doesn't know he's even with ghosts until after he gets rescued. Um, and then, of course, in a cup of tea, he doesn't know it until he fights the ghost. He actually duels with the ghost. So, um, yeah. But I thought it was a very good way to kind of open it up. Very strange, very creepy. Very creepy. <laughs> the music itself is really, mm -hmm. really, really good. Um, the Woman of the Snow. Mark, can you explain the legend of this? Like, the the legend or whatever, the Woman of the Snow? Uh, basically, she is a thing. I don't know exactly how to describe her. But she is this... She's a spirit? Or is she spirit? A demon? Or is she a demon? She's something of that... Something of that nature. Yeah. But basically, she's this very, very beautiful woman who, I guess, I think she only targets guys, I'm yeah. assuming. Yeah. She, like, she'll breathe on them, and they, like, basically freeze to death. Yeah. Okay. And also, in the movie, it, they say something about, like, how it almost feels like your blood is being sucked out. Yeah. Yeah, um, but this is, it is a very famous kind of folktale mm -hmm. in Japan. I'm not sure if the story, if this story itself is a part of that folktale, but the, her story is a folktale. Like, don't go out at night, children, or else the woman of the snow will get you and suck out all your blood. That kind of deal. From the interpretations I've seen, it's pretty much, it's pretty much like how it is, uh, oh, it is shown in here. Yeah. You see, I didn't know that. Um, so this is, you'd say, your favorite story as well from the four? Probably mostly because I was familiar with it. Yeah, okay. So, like, watching, so watching it, I was really, like, enjoying how this was being uh, interpreted. Yeah, I'd say this was my favorite simply on a, both a character level. Mm -hmm. I think it's my favorite on the character level and also the frickin' opening is so goddamn gorgeous. Yeah. The the eyes just constantly looking at you. And that music too. It's not just the wind sound effect. In fact the wind sound effect actually is muted over like the, the sound of almost like moaning. Like ooh like like it's like something kinda like whistling and creaking. It's it's so creepy and really, really scary if you have all the lights off. The, the sound in this in the opening is so eerie and so wonderfully done and wonderfully put together. Um, but also, I gotta say, this movie also has the wonderful and magnificent Tetsuya Nakadai in it. You don't really know, you didn't really know who he was, um, but he played in Yojimbo, Sanjiro, he plays the guy in Sanjiro where he gets sliced and all the blood comes flying out, that's him. But he played with Masaki Kobayashi. Masaki Kobayashi actually made him famous with the human condition. That was his yeah. first movie. He actually has a really kind of a deep character for such a short little story. Right. Because this one, this one isn't that long. This one isn't, I think it's the second shortest one. No, no. The, the last one is the shortest. The last one is definitely the shortest. Um, but anyways, um, but man, back to the sets. I just have to... Oh, Jesus. Those, <laughs> those sets are so beautiful. Like, I can't even yeah. say that enough. 
You know, like, like even after the snowstorm ends, all of a sudden it cuts to, like, daytime, and it's like a guy coming across, across on a raft finding... Yeah, like the... Um, yeah. The use of, like, a green sky. A green sky. That, a, like, red, a red sun. If you notice in the background, it's a, it's a bright red sun. And I'm yeah. like, oh, oh, oh okay. That, wow. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, the, to put it politely, everything is... A lot of whites and blues in this, in this one. Well, that, that, that would make sense. The, yeah, it would. Even, even the freaking the way how they shoot the woman... The woman of the snow, when she's in ghost form, is so creepy. And it's so minimalistic. There's nothing, there's yeah. no wires or anything. Or It's just a fan blowing on her and she walking and the look on her face. They blackened her teeth, not because of the same reason that the second wife did in the, in, uh, the black hair. But they blacked her teeth so that way they can shine a certain light on her to make it look like she has no teeth. Mm -hmm. And I liked that. That was really, really cool. But anyways, the ever-changing walls, too. The walls are never maintain the same what they did was they hired they put silk upon silk upon silk on these walls and they just shine a, a light differently on them and it would change the 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 set wall from like what looked like an eye looking at you to suddenly a regular sun or the other way or the regular sky or the other way around yeah especially at the end the ending where the woman of the snow walks up or runs back up into like the heavens or whatever when mm. when she's running away suddenly you see like the, the background wall changes to an eye that's how they did it was they just shined a different light on them it's really cool um so what is the overall story of this one mark these two guys an older one and a younger one i think uh, that was his father i i think from what i'm I believe he's just some, like, old man that, like, he's, like... Oh, he's probably the boss. He's probably, yeah, yeah. he's probably just some guy yeah. that he, um, is acquainted with. Yeah. But they were... They were, like, trekking out in the snowstorm. And I head back to... It was, like, it was their, their, like, little... Their hut. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a typical kind of story of... Oh, don't worry, it's not gonna snow, and oh, look, it's fucking snowing, and we're gonna fucking die. It's it's one of those kind of stories. And then they get trapped inside this hut. Yeah, and um, while they were asleep, the woman of the snow comes in, and she basically uh, kills the old man. Yeah. And the younger guy, he was there watching the whole time. And then she spots him. He thinks that she's gonna do the same to him, but she decides to let him go because she finds him, you know, attractive yeah. looking. But she gives him, she lets him go, but with a warning to never mention this. Otherwise, she will come back and kill him. Very creepy scene. Yeah. Very, it is so quiet. Everything with that scene is so quiet. You never hear her footsteps. Which is done on purpose. All you hear is your slow talking voice. But she never raises her voice. She just yeah. kind of talks in a whisper. And like, she gives that smile. That that smile, like that open smile. She's like, except I look fucking retarded when I do that. <laughs> but she, it, it's because they blackened her teeth, she looks like she has nothing in there. And it's so creepy and so beautifully done. Again, not scary. But incredibly creepy, and like the way how she kind of like floats out, and everything—it's it's gorgeous. I don't know how long it's been since that incident. It was like a couple years. Yeah, basically, you know, the the younger guy—he's um, living with his mother, and mm. like I think like on his way home, he spots this beautiful woman. Did you know? I bet you you did because you knew the story. Oh, uh, you knew that that was going to be the woman of the snow? Yeah. I didn't when I was a kid. I didn't. And to yeah, my, that's understandable, yeah. To my to my defense, because even when I was in seventh grade, I was pretty good, because I'd seen enough movies and stuff. I was pretty good at picking mm -hmm. up, okay, that's what this is going to be. Mm -hmm. I genuinely thought that was a different woman. Like an actual different actress and everything. And it's not. And it shows you the level of makeup and the, how lighting can affect how you look at everything. Yeah, but she looks completely different in that sunsetting light. Yeah, 
<laughs> then I, I'll, I, I'll give it that. Then she she looks very different in with that setting sun in the background than when she looked in the snow, and everything. He decides to let her stay at their place for for the night because it was getting it was getting late and all that. And I guess basically they the two of them they fall in love. They, they fall in love. They have. Three children. Three. She's popping out. She's popping them out. Like, like, them, right? like geez, yeah. they, get, they got busy. Uh, they even show them getting busy a little bit. You see him kissing her breast, which is not in the in the Kane's cut, by the way. Much much like the attacking hair, the ex, the exposure of the breast kind of surprised me as well. I'm like, it didn't mean it, it just, it just, did. just go like, mm, oh, tits, oh, okay. <laughs> it, it really surprised me too. I actually think it was more effective and actually got the point across better in the cans cut because in the cans cut, that's gone. It just cuts to them falling from the ground to them all of a sudden putting a baby in that warm pot of water. Mm -hmm. I actually thought that worked better because it less is more. So it's been some years that the children are growing up and... As some other people in the village have realized that the wife has not really aged that yeah. much. Yeah. Granted, neither has Tetsuya Nakata. He, he looks at, like he's still pretty damn young himself, but I'll, I'll leave that be. Um, but uh, basically the rest of the story is, is just that the, the husband kind of notices that as well. Yeah. And he goes on talking about how she looks like the woman. the woman of the snow. And as soon as he, you know, says all of that, yeah, she's like, Fuck you! Be like, <laughs> you gave out our secret. Which did he really? <laughs> I know, that was the um, thing that kind of... Yeah. That's the thing that kind of confuses me about the story, is that he is telling her... Right. And she is the woman of the sun. So is he really? Is he really giving giving away her secret? Yeah. And, uh, in which case, here, here's how I, I guess it's. More, it seems in that case, it's more of like kind of like a test in a way. That's what I was. That's how I interpreted it. Yeah. It was a test. Everything that she's been doing, which makes me hate this bitch, was a test. Um, and man, all of a sudden that set goes from being normally lit to. No cuts, no nothing, to the scariest looking thing you'll ever fucking see. Uh, it just, everything turns blue. And yeah. it's so terrifying, and it's so wonderful, and it's it's great. And then all of a sudden, like, in between cuts, they suddenly started coating things with ice. I don't know if you noticed that. Um, they started coating yeah. things with ice, and then when she leaves, all of a sudden, everything turns back to normal, and everything's mm -hmm. everything like that. Uh, so, so the, basically, the rest of it is, you know, she... Tells him like, "Oh, you gave out the secret," and then as she's she's like, "Oh, going to like, you know, you broke the promise, so I'm gonna kill you," but she decides not to, probably because of like the kids. It was the kids. She says flat out that the only, they're the reason why I'm not killing you, and if you do anything to make them gripe about you, I will kill you the way how you deserve. And then she runs off. And then she runs off, and the end. Essentially. Yeah. Now, the reason why I love this story so much is because of Tetsuya Nagadai's character. That poor motherfucker. Because he falls so hard for that girl. He generally... Just the way how he looks at her, you know, the way how... Um, for example, the first scene where they meet up, the way how he kind of like looks over his shoulder, kind of blushes whenever she talks to him. I'm like, yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, he's like making them sandals. And he's that's what he does for a living. He makes sandals for a living. And he's not a samurai, which is interesting. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's been making a humble living off of that. And then all of a sudden, when you find out that she is the woman of the snow, everything that he has felt for this girl has been fake. She has not felt a thing towards him. It's all been a test. Yeah. I'm like, that's horrible. And it's personified so beautifully with the ending. Because when she leaves... Tetsuya Nakadai grabs the sandals he made for her and placed them outside. So yeah. if she ever returned, she'd be welcome. And I'm like, oh my god. 
That's so sad. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then he, he starts crying, too. And that's how it fucking ends. It ends with him crying. Yeah, a lot of... I know a lot of uh, Japanese folk tales. A lot of them just... There, there are some that do end just on a sad note. Yeah, all right. It's, it's like... Okay. There's <laughs> nothing happy about this. It wasn't yeah. like Hoichi the Earless. Hoichi the Earless actually ends on a kind of happy note. Yeah. This one is such a downer. Um, and it, it makes me so surprised why this was cut out. I'm surprised this one was cut out and not in a cup of tea. Um, because this one's really, really good. <laughs> Even just on a visual level, it's really good. But mm -hmm. then you have a good character like Tetsuya Nakadai in there. It's really, really good. Was that was this the one that made you realize you were gonna like the movie? No, like I said before, I pretty much knew I was gonna enjoy oh, it did? from like okay. the start, All like right. with the like the uh, the opening credits. Or so, even the credits are fucking weird. But anyways, on to Hoichi the Earless, which Ho Hoichi the Earless is definitely the longest story. Yeah, I realized that. I, I was I thought that the, all the stories were gonna be like evenly timed out. No. But then, when I started watching Hoichi and realizing that it kept going, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, Hoichi the Earless is definitely the longest story, and it's actually the most famous story from Kwaidan. Like, if you type up Kwaidan on Google search, Hoichi the Earless is, like, the image of him with all the body paint on is, like, the first thing that will always pop up. Right, yeah. Um, and kind of rightfully so. I mean, this is a very good interesting story it's not scary it's not really creepy but it's a, it's a good kind of little story and wonderfully shot wonderfully executed everything that Zaki Kobayashi does is wonderfully executed and wonderfully shot but this film is very very colorful and everything like that this also had the most star-studded cast out of all the ones because this had Takashi Shimura who was you know the main samurai from Seven Samurai. I know him as Dr. Yamane from Godzilla. Mm -hmm. um, and he's in countless Akira Kurosawa films. Uh, it also has Toshimitsu Temba in it, and he played in a lot of Japanese movies. He was he became a huge star, mainly in the late 60s and 70s. He played in um, You Only Live Twice as Tiger Tanaka. Um, <laughs> I fucking love that name. Uh, but yeah, he, he was in this movie, and also the guy who plays Hoichi was quite well known, apparently. Um, he's actually played the, the Biwa in real life. Um, though it wasn't him singing or anything, but he actually played the Biwa in real life. But this whole episode, from beginning to end, is fucking gorgeous. Like, like beforehand, it was a lot of indoor stuff, like, like um, the woman, I mean, the, the woman of the snow, a lot of it was shot indoors, inside a cabin. Um, the, the black hair had a lot of indoor sets, very dark colors and everything. This film, from beginning to end, is just a gorgeous light fest. Like a gorgeous set fest. Yeah. And it's not surprising, considering the fact that these had the two biggest sets from the movie. And that battle scene alone was enough to, to feast my eyes enough. Yeah, like the battle. Big, by the way, battle scene. Um, yeah, that, that <laughs> scene like by itself would be good enough. Right, <laughs> um, and it's all done. It's there's no sound effects during that entire scene. It's all done with the with the story being the actual song being yeah. sung on a biwa, and um, again Toru Tokumitsu going full out with his sound effects and everything during that battle. Because at one point he adds like kind of like an electrical twang to it and everything mm -hmm. like that when the battle actually begins. It's very, very creepy. Very, very weird. Strangely, I actually think the battle is better paced and better edited in the Cannes version, but I'm not sure if that's because I grew up with that version and that's the version I remember more, because it's quite extended. It's about five minutes longer. Yeah, I could I could see the battle sequence being edited down a bit and yeah. still work. Because, like... Yeah. Because that battle sequence is pretty, like, the unedited version is pretty... It's pretty long. It's pretty long. <laughs> um, in fact, I'll go as far as to say as it drags a little. Um, yeah. Towards the end, I'm like, just move on already, all right? I get it. Uh, the Ken, I think the Ken's version is better edited and better put together. They cut out about five minutes, as I said, so... Mm -hmm. um, 
But even just the use of the colors in that scene, the orange walls, the red kind of like fire, the red banners burning, the fire burning. Yeah. Uh, gorgeously done, the uniforms, the use of blood. And then, of course, when, when, when Hoichi goes to the, uh, to the spirit world with those clansmen that died, it's just all blues and all reds and just the contrasting colors just work so beautifully. I can't believe this is his first color film. I can't say that enough. Like, wow. <laughs> like, a lot of people think that it'd be easy to go from, from black and white to color because we see in color. It's not. It's not. It's actually very difficult to do a transition like that. But wouldn't you say this is probably the most complicated story out of them all? Yes. Yeah. Okay, try it, try it, Mark, try it. We'll talk about it as it goes along. The story is, well, our main character is the title character, Hoichi. He works, works at a temple and he is, he's blind. He's blind, but he's also pretty good. He plays a pretty mean he, Biwa. He plays a pretty mean Biwa. I'd pay a dollar to go see him. <laughs> so yeah, one night he's just uh, he's just outside, you know, strumming along, and then this this warrior comes up to him. Say, Played by Toshimitsu Temba. That's Toshimitsu Temba. Okay. Great performance by him, by the way. Just how stoic he looks. And every scene he's in, it's like, oh god, you know, he's got command of the room. Um, he he comes in, you know, he he comes up and tells Weichi that that like you know his that you know his lord wants him to come and like you know play play some songs for him, and so he willingly goes. Well, and, I I think it'd be important if we mention that. Th these ghosts, their ghosts that yes. wanted to play for him, were the clan that originally owned that land, but they died during a battle. They're yeah, during the, the opening battle of yeah, the, the, the battle is um, the battle of Don no Uda. And That's how you the, pronounce it. Yeah, I was like the, Don Uhura from Star yeah. Trek. <laughs> um, it was the battle between the. Genji and the Heike clan. Look at this fucker. That's what... It apparently really happened, though. This yeah, whole story it, really happened. Yeah. The, the whole thing with the Genji and the Heike, are, it's a pretty uh, famous thing. But, but this was this was their, the, the last stand battle, and mm. they all killed themselves. All the royalty ended yeah. up killing themselves. Yeah, the, the clan that Hoichi's going to is the Heike clan. Yeah, and they're all dead. Yeah. And including the emperor, who was like this little tiny kid. That looked like a girl. Was it was it popular to, to do that for little boys? Back then to shave off their eyebrows and do the woman thingy? Because that looked like a little girl to me. But they say it's a little boy. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know. Alright. Well, continue, well, Mark. So yeah, basically we figure out that Hoichi has just been playing to a bunch of ghosts. And the other... Uh, priests they they discover that Luigi's being been like you know going out late at night yeah and then and then they uh, well, well they, every time every time he'd return he'd get really pale and he'd look very sickly right it was almost like every time he went there like some of his life force was like being drained from him and that's what Takashi Shimura the head priest of this temple says the makeup job is really good he looks genuinely really really sick disgusting like they spray him down with water and stuff not that they really had to with how freaking hot those sets were but they like spray him down with water to make him look like he's sweating and everything like that it very very sickly wonderfully done so uh the priests discover what Luigi has been doing because they find him just sitting at the graveyard the graveyard of yeah. the clan yeah and they think like, like yeah. oh, we gotta be, we gotta like you know, get these you know, get rid of these ghosts from like. You know. Which, which the scene that that happens is so creepy, because you got like these dancing flames and stuff that kind oh, of yeah. float around them, and then on top of that, everything around them looks normal, and like like the clan is just sitting there listening to him playing the the call of the battle, and all of a sudden it's like they all start dying. 
like left and right, like they start getting like arrows shot in them and everything, and they're just kind of like staring there at them. Very, very sad because it's like they're all recalling their own deaths and everything, yeah. and like all and the set starts falling apart and everything, and then suddenly when the ghosts come back, all of a sudden everything is back, or when when Hiroichi gets carried away by his friends, all of a sudden they return back to normal. And it's also some great shots where all of a sudden you see like where, where the warrior stands is where his grave is. Yeah. I loved mm -hmm. that. I love that like fade to where their little shrine is. I really freaking love that. Okay, so knowing of knowing of Hoichi's problems, the priests in an attempt to get rid of, you know, these spirits from, you know, taking him away, they decide to um, cover Huichi's body all in um, all in sutras, like yeah. right, sutras all over his body. Because wait, what are what are sutras? Uh, like kind of like they're spirit kinda, be gone. They're like you know Buddhist prayers. And okay, stuff. all right. And when the war, when that warrior comes back, oh, I love this. He doesn't. He can't see anything, but the only thing that he can see is Huichi's ears because the priests have forgotten paint the sutras on his ears. Yeah. And so basically as like a way of saying like I was here. Yeah. He rips, rips them off. And it's very it's kind of disturbing to watch. It's, it's, it, is, it is. It's very violent. Yeah. Um, because it, he's it, just it, like he's genuinely he's just it, like it, yanking them. Yeah and that, that was all acting too. Yeah. That was the, the, he was actually getting thrown against the wall. Um Temba grabs Hoichi by the ears and literally is just throwing him around this set. Yeah. And you can, like, it... You get hurt just watching it. Like, you grab your ears and you're like, oh, God. And then when he finally manages to rip him off, like, if you notice that there's just some blood, a little blood, and then all of a sudden, like, a lot of blood. Yeah. And it's... It's horrifying. It's terrifying. And you feel so bad for poor little Hoichi because he had no idea he was getting into this shit. And then all of a sudden, what did he do? He fucking forgot to paint the things on his ears. And now he has no ears. Which is why this is called Hoichi the Earless. Uh, yeah, the so all that happens. And the end of the story, it kind of, it the end of the story... It's on a good note. On a, pretty, on a pretty, you know, happy note. Is that his deafness and also blindness that that's a double whammy right there it does and but still he is um no he's not deaf he can still hear everything it's just oh he doesn't yeah have, he just doesn't have his earlobes or like what's really yeah okay weird. okay that makes sense i was a bit confused i'm like wouldn't you wouldn't you just like go deaf if you like got your ears ripped off so so the end of it is that huichi is known you know, for playing the instrument, so he basically just gets well, he gets recognition for you know playing these songs. Yeah, a lot of people start coming and giving the the temple rewards and a lot of yeah. stuff. It ends on a pretty damn good note. It does, considering yeah. what the last movie ended on. Um, also, did you ever notice like all the blood all over the walls the day after they find Hoichi? I think so. Like like when when. Shimura is praying over him, you'll see there's a bloody handprint on the wall. And I'm like, oh god! <laughs> uh, it's also really interesting to know how much all these people actually care for Hoichi. Like, it's not like he was on his own. Like, I really thought that was a nice little touch that all these people, including the people that, that go out and find him, genuinely care about him. I think, I think, though not my favorite section, this is easily number two. This is easily, like, right underneath it. Uh, this is gorgeous. <laughs> Not only gorgeous, but just a really good tale. And the thing with this movie, too, is that you can almost show this in any order. And it doesn't really matter. You can show this movie in any order. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Or you can just show somebody one section of the movie, mm -hmm. right? It's not like one that you have to absolutely sit down and watch the entire thing in, like, one sitting. You can just watch whichever one you want to watch. It's a good, it's a good little story like that. Though I, I tried to do it in one sitting, except for I had some technical difficulties. You did. On to the most confusing story, in my opinion. 
of lunch, and that's in a cup of tea. What the fuck happened in this? I don't get it, Mark. Explain it to me, please. I still don't get it. There's, there's this samurai. Oh my god! Well, actually, the first thing that you need to mention is that this story all of a sudden takes place in the year 1900, begins in the year 1900. Oh yeah, the, this, it's, it starts off in like a sort of like some years into the... It's supposed to be like the year of Lugiro Hearn was writing his stories. Yeah. That's what year it's supposed to be. And it starts with that, and it's like, and oh, here's it, this tale of... Blah, yeah, blah, basically blah. saying, that, like, oh, this this tale, like, it doesn't really have, like, an ending because it never was finished. Or yeah, something it was like never... That. Yeah, that was it. That was it. It was never finished. Then all of a sudden it jumps to 250 years late, uh, earlier. Was it 250? It was 200 something. Yeah. It jumps to 250 years earlier, and that's when the story really begins. And it's odd. It's a cavalcade of oddness. So, there's a samurai. There's a samurai. <laughs> he goes to get a cup of tea, and he looks. He looks in the cup, and in like the, the reflection of the tea is this grinning face of this guy that is not him. At first, he's a bit confused, and he just you know puts the cup down and he goes to like another cup it's the same guy and that's where he starts to get a little bit upset to the I point, to the point, where, to the the point where he just like tosses the cup and breaks it there's also like this weird buzzing sound throughout it and he looks up and like there's this random fucking kite that's hanging above him that's not in the cans version by the way uh but there's like this buzz it sounds like bees buzzing throughout that sequence did you not hear it um, and then all of a sudden, like, you'll put down the cup and it'll go away. And then all of a sudden, you'll pick it up and he'll look down and then it'll start up again. It's... Uh, it may have been cicadas. It was, it, it had something, it was with the soundtrack. It was, it was... To, to and I, I don't, I can't, I can't remember. I was too busy seeing a man in... A cup it, of tea. <laughs> oh, God. So he... Drinks it, right? He yes. eventually says, fuck it. And he drinks it. And that's where I think the story kind of begins. Or truly begins. Because it says towards the end, it's like, what do you do if you swallow a man's soul? The narrator says something along that line. So it's like, yeah. what's the whole ghost going after him because he swallowed a man's soul? Was his soul in this cup of tea? Why is, this, why is his soul in the cup of tea in the first place? First off, this ghost is an asshole. Yeah, a major troll. Um, I mean, from the <laughs> beginning, is he just got like in the in the reflection of the tea? He's just got this smug ass face. Oh god, I wanted to punch him. Yeah, but but you couldn't because it was Cause just it was just take tea. that. You're, now you just get your oh. hand wet. <laughs> take that, Takashi. What are you doing punching tea? Nothing. <laughs> I'm being very honorable today. <laughs> So later on that day, the, the fucking reflection guy comes back. Like he kind of you know comes up as a spirit, and you know, because because this samurai is a night guard at this palace. Yeah, and you know he he starts freaking out, and to the point where he's getting like everyone to like search the premise. For well, it's guy. it isn't very important to note that apparently he hurts the ghost because he strikes out the at the ghost with the sword, and he actually manages to hurt the ghost, the spirit. Yeah. Which I'm like, how? And then all of a sudden, the, the spirit walks away, and the samurai's like, WHAT THE FUCK?! And so he's like, and he's like, screaming, getting everyone up, and everything like that. And, and then, no one can find the spirit, so he's put on, like, rest duty, or whatever. Like, he just, just sleep. Just sleep for a little bit. You'll, you'll calm the fuck down. Take, 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 take some pills. Take ten. Um, and be honorable in your room. He gets a notice saying that there's these three men who want You'll to see him. You'll be visited by three samurai. Did you just make a, a Christmas carol? A Christmas carol? Is that the story? Is that with Ebenezer Scrooge? Yeah. You just made that reference on me? I, you I, will be visited by three samurai spirits. So anyways, these, these guys show up. One's wearing purple, one's green, and one's yellow, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. One of them is played by Ace Yamamoto, 
who is mainly known for me for playing Doctor Who in King Kong Escapes. And so I like to think that this is the spirit of Doctor Who, and that's how he managed to get the voice of Paul Fries in King Kong Escapes, was that he just, like, swallowed Paul Fries up in, like, his spiritiness and just took in his voice. It's a part of the conspiracy theory. There's a large conspiracy theory going around of what I think the secret origins of Doctor Who are. So, anyways. So this fight scene happens between the samurai and these three ghosts. Yeah. What the fuck was this fight scene? Like, it's so bizarre. Like, Sunday it'll, like, go to, like, freeze frames. Yeah. Yeah, which is actually a Kobayashi trait. I don't know why he does that, but he does it. Um, and then... All we see are their shadows, and then all of a sudden, all we see are them, and then I did kind, of, I did kind of like that one, like yeah, when when you just saw like the shadows from like the walls, yeah, I, I kind of like that how they were able to pull that off. And the music during the sequence was so bizarre. <laughs> it was so it's so weird, and so un unwestern. It's so un like Western ears would not be used to, like Western ears would not be used to hearing this kind of score. And he actually manages to kill them or to hurt them, and then all of a sudden they just come right back. In the meantime, things are going in slow motion. And then all of a sudden he starts laughing like he's the fucking Joker. Which I love the image of that, by the way. His laugh, he's one, he's got an amazing evil laugh, but and he needs to do more evil, the actor, he needs to do more evil laughs. But, and then all of a sudden it ends. And you're like, there's no more? Like, what happens if the spirits eat him? Well, well what? just like the beginning, beginning of the segment says that the story didn't have an ending. And then that story doesn't have an ending because all of a sudden you have like, what was it, like this publisher or something's like, where's your husband's story? And the girl's like, oh, I haven't seen him for a while. And she's like, oh, I'll make you a cup of tea. And she oh, there's a reflection. And it's in his entire body. And he's like summoning you to come in with him. And it's like the final image of the movie. Well, I thought the final image was the, well, well, the, the, the empty cup. cup of tea. I, um, I actually thought that, like, that that part, like, the reflection was going to be the end of it. Yeah, but I'm glad it wasn't. Yeah, I, I thought it was more fitting with the empty cup of tea. As soon as I saw that, um, as soon as I saw the cup, I'm like, okay, that's going to be the end. Yeah. First off, the image of the guy who was the the writer inside the inside the fucking pot. And he's just like twirling things around. He's like reaching up for you. I'm like, oh my god, uh, very very creepy. He's covered in like this old man makeup. Like he looks like he's kind of like decomposing and rotting. Mm -hmm. Very very creepy. In comparison with the others, what do you think it, of this? It does. While the others, you know, had a beginning, middle, and end. I mean, this obviously didn't have an end because that's what. Right. Yeah, that's that's just that's how it the was. point. Yeah. But this this one did feel kind of not really out of place. It's just felt kind of odd. Because Saying that the rest of the film is normal. Yeah, because like the um, others, the <laughs> other stories kind. Of, again, I'm kind of being repetitive, but the other stories felt complete. Well, they they exactly. were complete. They were complete. This this one, there's no end. And because there's no end, you're left going, what the fuck? And even the images in this... First off, there's no extreme set in this movie. It's very, very naturalistic compared to the other ones. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that's anywhere, anything kind of remotely, like, really kind of interesting in comparison with the other ones in terms of the color with the three samurai spirits that show up to get him, to get the main character. Very, very strange. Very, very strange. I mean, it's still good, because visually it still looks really good. The, the cinematography right. and stuff. Story-wise, it's very weak, in my opinion, compared to the other one. This is definitely my least favorite of the stories. I kind of almost wish that, like, this one was first. But then at the end, at the end of the day, I'm like, this doesn't have an end. Does this movie really have an end? Because it's an anthology movie, will it really have an end? So it kind of fits why, the, it kind of makes sense why they put this as the last section of the film. Yeah, I, I do, I would say that, you know, that the order of these stories were, were done pretty well. Yes. Like, like yeah. The, they, if, if it was done in a different order, I, it, would, it wouldn't have worked as well. I agree. From, I agree. Um, 
I think again. I think I think it was right that this movie was last, just because of how it was very ambiguous the ending and kind of like the whole movie. So I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's I think it was very well done. Um, actually, uh, it it made me very happy to see that WatchMojo.com put this as number put this in their top ten anthology movies list. Really? They yeah, did. they actually put this in there. Uh, what position? I think it was number nine. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was really low in the list, but the fact that they put it in there. Yeah. Like, really makes me happy. It was like when they put the original Godzilla in the top ten greatest Japanese movies ever made, and it was like, they genuinely put it on par with films by Masaki Kobayashi and Akira Kurosawa. Yeah. Like, they genuinely put it on par with that and called it a good movie. Like, I, I have a lot of respect for Watch Mojo. I'll just say that. Like, I may not agree with their lists, but I have a lot of respect for them. Um... But anyways, it made me very happy to see that this was on this list. So, Mark, what was your overall thoughts of this movie? In conclusion. In conclusion. Yes. Uh, it was... It was very entertaining. Like, even though I was familiar with stuff like this, I still um, liked how it was done, how it was shot, the, the pacing. You're very slow. It's slow, but... It's a good slow. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very good slow. It's not like Star Trek, the slow motion picture. This it's, is a good slow. This, this movie has a great pace. Actually, the, the thing is... Um, so I did a little bit of research to see if the other... If any of the other stories were um, featured on there. And I did discover that Hoichi the Earless and In a Cup of Tea were on there as well. Were they really? And so I rewatched them and... It is a bit, it, it is definitely different, one, because it's, I mean, though it, though it is supposed to be for children, it's still the same story. It's like Oichi the Earless. Uh, like, it does keep, it does yeah. keep the whole thing, like, with the ears being ripped off. There is blood, but not, like, as graphic as it is. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was three of the stories except for the first one, so I can actually... It was um, pretty interesting knowing that I have already had experience with most of these stories. Right. I adore this movie to death. I this is my my third favorite Mizaki Kobayashi film. Um, I can't say that enough. I think this movie is just gorgeous. Watch it, people. You have to fucking watch this movie. Uh, it, it may be three hours, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And again, you can break this movie down into a few nights because it's an anthology film. Yeah, you, you can you can watch one story one day and then another story the other day. It's right. Like, yeah. Um, wonderful film. Um, now, now, having watched this, are you at all interested in watching any other Mizaki Kobayashi film? Uh, probably, yeah. I would I would say for any any Japanese film because his films are full of like those kind of like push in those kind of like creepy kind of like tracking shots the yeah. slow moving camera his films are just full of those unlike Kurosawa who is known for keeping his his cameras very static you know and using geometrical shapes and stuff like that Mizaki Kobayashi was known for moving the camera um, but yeah an absolutely wonderful film what would you rate this film really? would you rate it an A A from an A to F where would you rate this movie oh definitely an A a minus, A plus. I'd say just an A. Just an A. Just so a, 90, a, a solid ninety-five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I easily give this movie a four out of four. I mean, this movie is damn. This movie's gold. Gold. This film needs to be preserved for all time. Quite frankly, this is like one of those movies. If there is ever the nuclear apocalypse, I hope this movie is preserved. Um, <laughs> granted, I also hope that Plan 9 from Outer Space is preserved. So, uh, it just to give you the kind of level of what I want. Uh, but, excellent movie, and I highly, highly recommend it. So, that being said, Mark, do you have anything to pimp out, or no? No. No. Well, by the time this is released, you will already know the release date for which way they walk. And you will also know that we have already wrapped the film, and that the film will be released to the general public very, very soon. We have worked very hard on that. We hope you enjoy. I'm in it. He is in it. He plays... Who do you play? Lieutenant Hans Blake. Right. 
And he's actually kind of like the main character in the movie, so you guys should actually really watch it and fucking love it. Watch it for me. Watch it for him. Jerk off to him and everything like that. Oh, please. It's, it's good. Um, but anyways, uh, go on Facebook, like Which Way They Walk for more up-to-date information on DVD releases and so on and so forth. Go on Facebook, like AM Productions for all up-to-date information about what I'm doing and everything like that. Uh, or just what we're doing for films and everything, so on and so forth. Like the Godzilla Saga, we're almost at 500 likes. Actually, I'm pretty sure that by the time this is released, we'll be a little over 500. Um, and join our group Geeks for Geeks. Um, though you're not really a part of that, my uh, five other geeks and I have kind of come together and really brought this kind of small little tight-knit geek group together. If you have anything to promote I on there. Well, you are, but you're not one of the yeah. admins. Oh, yeah. Um, if you have anything you want to promote that you do and that you're passionate about, this is the group where you want to be. We love it when you promote yourself. We love it when we get to share what we make and what we love to do. So join Geeks for Geeks there and be who you were born to be, as the slogan is. And in the end, joining me was Mark Allen Shoppy Jr. Say goodbye. Goodbye. And this is Adam Noise of AM Productions saying, Sayonara. Sayonara.